Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, Housing TO 2020-2030 Action Plan um, Forum, International Forum uh, and Discussion Panel on, uh, on Housing. Um, first of all, I want to uh, extend greetings to you on behalf of uh, Mayor Tory and Toronto City Council, um, but also to welcome you to the Toronto Reference Library. It's terrific in Toronto that we have such wonderful public facilities and um, we'll remind ourselves as well as our guests from out of the city that Toronto has the um, largest public library system in the world. Uh, this is not the Trillium Book Awards. <laughs> the Trillium Book Awards are happening upstairs, which is also a wonderful thing too. Um, we're, we're extremely delighted to welcome you here tonight. Um, I was reminded in 2009 when we developed the first plan that we'd had a similar forum with speakers from uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, from uh, Chicago, and also from Vancouver. And we're uh, delighted tonight to have a number of speakers with us. And if you've picked up uh, the um, poster, you'll have their uh, biographies and their information, but I'll be introducing them shortly to you. Um, I also want to thank tonight, uh, before we get going, a little shout out to our technicians, uh, Lisa and Zach. Uh, tonight's um, uh, presentations will be uh, video recorded and will be um, on um, the city's website. So uh, if you're taking notes, that's great, but uh, we'll also make available to you the, uh, the slide presentations that they have. Um, I'd also like to have a shout out as well to Michelle McMaster from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, um, a vital partner in the work that we're doing on housing, and uh, a shout out to the federal government with their work around the national housing strategy. So thank you very much, Michelle. Um, in addition to that, there's a couple of other people. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Mercedes, Sherry, and Eric in my office that are engaged in this process around the plan and Zoe and Liz from uh, Lura Consulting. So a big round of applause for them. <laughs> and of course we have uh, the Deputy Mayor and the City's Housing Advocate in the room, Anna Bailau. <laughs> I think it's appropriate for us tonight, uh, but perhaps even more meaningful in light of the report that came out last week with respect to um, indigenous women and girls um, that have been victimized in our country that we begin with an Aboriginal welcome and prayer and I'd like Francis Sanderson to come up from Anishinaabe Homes. Thank you for First of all, the land that I'm standing on today is a traditional territory of many nations including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit, Métis, and First Nations. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, which is signed between the city and the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I, I'm sure you all don't understand really why we do a land acknowledgement, but it, it's very important. I myself don't have to do it because I'm standing on my own land. But most of you all, all of a sudden I'm from the south, most of you all should know a territorial or land acknowledgement involves making a statement recognizing the traditional territory of the indigenous people who called the land <coughs> excuse me, home before the arrival of settlers, and in many cases still do call it home. Indigenous peoples have been acknowledging the land at the start of gatherings, ceremonies, and events for time immemorial. With the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 
more non-Indigenous people are becoming aware of the importance. Providing a land acknowledgement at the beginning of an event or meeting gives time for reflection and demonstrates recognition of Indigenous lands, treaties, and people. It involves thinking about what happened in the past and what changes can be made going forward in order to further the reconciliation process. Land acknowledgements mark a small and important step in the process of reconciliation and building positive relationships with Indigenous people. By making a land acknowledgement, you're taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land and Indigenous presence, which dates back over 10,000 years. Just a little education. Uh, my name is Francis. I am a Anishinaabe Kwe, an Ojibwe woman from Whitefish River First Nations, and my clan is uh, Crane. We acknowledge our, our language by starting that way uh, before we do a blessing. Um, Jemnado, Nokomis, Mishumis, Creator, Grandfathers and Grandmothers, Miigwech, thank you for bringing us all together in this place tonight. Thank you for giving us a sound mind to think with, good eyes to see with, good ears to listen to, a mouth to speak with, and a heart for passion to do the work that we do. We call on the grandmothers and grandfathers of the four directions to bring their wisdom to us, to help us to understand the issues, the problems, and how we can work towards fixing them. Hundreds of years ago, we never had a homeless problem. We had homes for everyone. Now it seems that we're all fighting the same battle. So we call on all, all the strength from all of our nations to come together tonight and listen to what's happening in the world. We're grateful for all these things. And for that, we say to the Creator, we say miigwech, miigwech, and thank you. Th thank you very much, Francis. Um, I also tonight want to acknowledge um, all of the Torontonians, including many of the people in the room here today. A number of uh, members of the City of Toronto's External Advisory Committee are here on the housing plan, but also we've touched uh, thousands of Torontonians over the course of the last uh, two months. Tonight's event is um, beginning the conclusion of the um, consultations with the public. There will be an event tomorrow at uh, Regent Park at the Daniel Spectrum that will also include the speakers that are here this evening as well as we drill down on some of the ideas that you're going to hear about tonight. Um, in addition to that, there are 50 different community organizations across the city that are also holding their own consultations. So we're really thrilled with the depth of involvement and the interest that uh, people um, are expressing. Um, I want to also tonight uh, really thank Councillor Anna Bailau, uh, who has, uh, over the last nine years, carried the housing file at the City of Toronto. Um, and I'd like to invite her to come up and um, provide a few remarks about this process, but also uh, to express how excited uh, the City is, um, because frankly, there's very high expectations in light of the current crisis we find ourselves in, um, a crisis, frankly, that is deeper than what it had been 10 years ago when we created the first plan. Uh, Councillor Milo. Thank you, Sean. I can't believe it's been already nine years. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. I want to start by thanking you for, for being here today uh, and, and uh, sharing your evening. Uh, we're starting to have a few nice evenings to be out, so for you to spend your wonderful spring evening here with us, it means a lot. I also want to thank Francis for wonderful uh, land acknowledgement. Thank you for, for joining us here today and for that acknowledge. And I want to welcome and thank our uh, panel, uh, Dr. Mark Joseph, uh, Dr. Nani Brennan, and Andrea 
Gilman, thank you for joining us here today. We're looking forward to listen to your ideas and, and having this um, uh, conversations. Uh, before I begin, I know that Sean already thanked uh, the members of the External Advisory Committee, but I really want to uh, thank them because uh, uh, there's a group of Torontonians that have been dedicating a lot of hours uh, thinking and sharing their thoughts and having conversations uh, about this issue, which uh, I think is the most pressing issue that is facing uh, our city. And so to all of them, thank you so much for, for um, the time there you're, you're spending with us and for your wise advice. Um, obviously, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues at, at City Council. I think that everybody's looking forward to having this plan coming to the council floor um, to reflect on, on the previous one, but to look forward and to see how we can do better. We know that there's a lot that needs to, 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 be, to be done. And we are here tonight as part of the housing 2020-2030 action plan consultations. And so um, we've, like Sean said, we've had thousands of people that participated in this consultation. And uh, we are just now starting to scratch through all those issues and all uh, those uh, uh, ideas. And we know that our biggest challenge is that there's now, today, uh, a current, a huge backlog of need for housing, and we are expecting even more people to come to our city. Over the next 20 years, we're going to have an extra million people, and uh, we need to act now, and we know that the urgency of the issue has just been increasing. And we're coming to an end of our first 10-year housing plan, and as Sean said, you know, um, I've, I've been... Uh, working on this file, I think, since I was first elected. And um, I've been reflecting a little bit on what has been the change, and, and I wanted to share some of my interpretation, because I think that we as a city have changed significantly in the way that we look at the issue and that we're facing and interpreting the issue, uh, but Torontonians have as well. Um, I was just sharing with one of our panelists, when I started working on this issue about nine years ago, a lot of people in politics would come up to me and say, why are you doing this? This is political suicide. Nobody votes on housing issues. Why are you devoting so much time on this stuff? Like, and I, and we, I would say, well, somebody has to do it. This is an important issue. I remember us, uh, Sean and I, scratching our heads saying, how are we going to grab some attention? We, every time we had an article about housing or shelters or something in, in the newspaper, we were like, yeah, we've got an article. Somebody's paying attention to what we're saying and what we're doing. Um, and now you see that this is an issue that, you know, it's probably on a daily basis in, in the newspaper. And not that we're happy. I wish, I wish that wasn't the case. But the reality is that uh, in our housing spectrum, going from our shelter system all the way to market housing, I say there's red, red lights all over the place. We, we, ha we are having issues at every point of the spectrum, from shelter, from supportive housing, from af social housing, affordable housing, to market housing. And, and so Torontonians are feeling that this is really an issue that we need to pay attention. And so even though it's been a long time, I feel like constantly we're, we're catching up. We're not doing it. We haven't done enough in these 10 years, and it feels like the problem just keeps growing and growing and growing. And um, I think that can be discouraging. But at the same time, I think for us has been encouraging in the sense that we've also seen a shift in Torontonians because they are demanding action. We're finally getting people that are talking to their elected officials at all levels. They're talking to people and saying, we need to address this issue. We need to do something about this issue. So that is positive. The other thing is that over the last, the last 10 years since I've been elected, I've seen even a shift at City Council. City Council, for the first time, for example, has acknowledged that they have a role to play in repairing Toronto community housing. They have a role to play in creating robust housing policy. And this is a change because, you know, I think that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we had, you know, before the 90s, we had a federal government that was heavily, heavily involved in housing. And so we, we, are, we had to make that shift from municipalities being used to having 
policy and direction and, and, and funds coming from the or other orders of government to us saying, wait a minute, nothing is coming. We have to take a leadership role. Not only we have to advocate, but we also have to put up our own land, do you know incentives to create renter housing and some affordable housing, push for things like inclusionary zoning, look into other things like modular house or ways to do other housing. So we're taking a leadership role. And I think that council has accepted that responsibility and has mandated us, that's how I feel to say, go out, consult with the community and bring us a robust 10 year plan. Something that is doable, that is practical, that we can achieve, but something that pushes and that has um, leadership written all over it, that has innovation written all over it, and that has um, livability written all over it. And so uh, I really want to thank all of you because I think that's what we're going to get out of that plan because I've been in some consultations and I've, he I've heard some ideas. Um, we know that it's, it's, it's not going to be easy, but I think that we all understand that um, this is an issue that if we are to have and to a thriving city, that people want to come and live here, that people want to come and work here, that there's jobs coming in here, this is an issue that we need to address. And we need to address it not only at market housing, we need to address it all the way from, you know, the most vulnerable residents all the way to the, you know, the young graduates that is having difficult uh, renting or you know, living close to their job. That's what we need to get with this plan. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're, we're gonna have a robust plan and we can only do that with the participation of so many of you. So thank you for joining us here today and thank you for your uh, advice and participation. Thank you. And a big shout out to my friend, Sean. So I, you know, you probably haven't heard a lot of politicians say this, because, you know, politicians and bureaucrats don't get along all the time. <laughs> but I have to say, and I'm very proud to say this, that a lot of what I know and the experience that I bring in this field, I've learned from this man that has a ton of experience. So thank you, Sean, for everything you do on the housing sector. Okay. Oh, I'm feeling chilly. Um, okay, so we're going to start off then. We've got three distinguished speakers with us this evening, and uh, we're going to start off uh, with uh, Dr. N Noni Brennan. Uh, so a big Toronto welcome to uh, Noni. Uh, her biography is in your uh, package there, and um, we're delighted to have you here. Um, and she is from, she's the CEO of the All Chicago Making Homelessness History. What a great idea. Noni? <laughs> and let me say that uh, our format tonight is we've given each of the speakers about 15 minutes. Uh, we are then going to uh, have a panel uh, and questions from the audience. We are looking though, just for a moment here, we have a technical issue, which is the notes that Noni had left here have disappeared. Has a anybody taken them? Oh. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. I knew there was a guilty party. <laughs> Noni, they're all yours. Thank you. I probably could have done it without the notes, but it's like, it's like my comfort blanket, you know? You can probably sleep without it, but do you really want to? Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to Toronto. Uh, because I'm actually a Canadian who somehow ended up living in America for the last 28 years. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, but I have, um, I have made great friends with uh, the Americans and we've done some great work together. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've learned in Chicago about ending homelessness. And um, hopefully it will spur some ideas for... Toronto. So I also think, oh yeah, here's the flicker. And let's see what happens. No. Oh wait. No. Oh, 
on the side. Oh. Zach, would you come back here? Oh, that's definitely off. Uh -huh. Woo! There we go. Okay. Oh, now it's flying like <laughs> crazy. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the things we've learned in Chicago about what the key elements are to ending homelessness. Wrong way. Aha. And so just to tell you a little bit about the organization that I run in Chicago, it's called All Chicago, and we provide the backbone support to Chicago's homeless system. We secure, monitor, and evaluate almost $100 million in funding, um, both public and private funding, that comes to Chicago for the issue of homelessness. And what we've done in Chicago is we've taken and moved forward a systems thinking approach to addressing the issue of homelessness. And so our organization really developed to deal with the really critical social issue of decades of increasing numbers of people experiencing homelessness in our community. And we kept working and thinking about how you can address this issue and how you can change this from increasing the number of people experiencing homelessness to start to decrease the number of people experiencing homelessness. And so the really simple answer is if you want to start to decrease the number of people experiencing homelessness in your city, you have to focus on three things. The first is you have to stop thinking that you're in the charity business and you have to understand that you're in the complex problem solving business. Because giving people a cot and a hot does not end homelessness, it actually keeps people homeless. Secondly, you need to take a collective impact approach to addressing the issue of homelessness. No one organization can do it by themselves. The city of Toronto can't end homelessness by themselves. The YMCA, the Salvation Army, the United Way cannot end homelessness by themselves. You have to bring together a broad-based collaborative effort and you have to work together to address this complex problem. And thirdly, you have to have incredible data because it's understanding what's happening in your homeless system is going to allow you to develop strategies to change what's happening. And so an example of how we started to think differently about what our role was in addressing the issue of homelessness comes with an example of an organization that, um, that I ran in the um, early 2000s called the Emergency Fund. And the Emergency Fund for many years had been a small family charity and it focused on providing one-time financial assistance to people who were in financial crisis. So if somebody um, needed help to pay for a prescription uh, because one of their children was ill or um, they needed help with, you know, paying their rent because they were going to be evicted or they needed help with um, something else that the family couldn't afford, the emergency fund would provide that support. And in about 2003, we had two incredible things happen in Chicago that made us think differently about what was possible. One was that we were, in the, in, we were at the very beginning of our first plan to end homelessness, our 10-year plan to end homelessness. And one of the most significant areas in that plan was addressing the issue of homelessness prevention. Secondly, 
the emergency fund had made the decision that they didn't want to be a small family charity anymore. They really wanted to become a community organization really focused on supporting the community and in, in really providing something more than just charity. And so we started to look at what is it that the emergency fund really does. And when we looked at where that financial assistance was going, we understood that almost all of the time, it was either paying people's rent or paying their utilities to either stop the utilities from being turned off or stop somebody from being evicted. And in learning that, we started to understand, wait, we're not in the financial assistance business, we're in the homelessness prevention business. And once we understood that, we could look at what does that really mean and how is homelessness prevention addressed in the city of Chicago. And what we learned was there was really no system in place for providing or addressing the issue of homelessness prevention. And so at the emergency fund, we set about making a plan and executing a plan to build a homelessness prevention system in Chicago. So the first thing we did was we found out where all of the homelessness assistance funding was. There's state funding, there's federal funding, there's city funding, there's private funding, and we brought all of that funding. I, when I say it now, it sounds easy, but I gotta tell you, <laughs> we had a lot of challenges along the way. But we brought all of that funding to the emergency fund, and then we founded the Homelessness Prevention Call Center. And in Toronto, you have 211. And 311 and 211. Right. In Chicago, we have 311, but we knew that, there was that, that it was going to take a long time for 211 to come to, to um, Chicago. And so we partnered with the city's 311. And anyone who was on the verge of eviction could call the city's 311 number and say, I'm going to be evicted. I need short-term financial assistance. My utilities are going to be shut off. And they would be immediately transferred to the Homelessness Prevention Call Center. They didn't even know they were in a different place other than 311. And what happened at the call center was they were assessed to determine if they qualified for assistance. And if they did, which fund did they qualify for? Because every single fund had different requirements. And so we streamlined the process. And once we knew what people qualified for, we were able to determine, because we also tracked how much funding was available in each of these funds. And so we could refer people to a fund that we knew they qualified for and that we knew there was funding available for. And so we changed the way we did business from providing charity to providing a system that served not only people who were looking for financial assistance and who were on the verge of eviction, but it also helped people in the working professions who were helping people who were struggling because they too were able to identify where there was funding available and when. And so, When we think about building a system that's focused on ending homelessness instead of allowing it to increase decade after decade, the other thing we need to think about is building a collective impact approach. And in Chicago, the way that that works is we follow the five elements of collective impact. Our common agenda is our second plan to end homelessness, Plan 2.0. And when we developed our Plan 2.0, we went through a, a process similar to what you're doing today with your housing plan, was we brought everybody together in a variety of different ways, and we got everybody's input in developing this plan. We have a shared measurement system, which is what we call our HMIS system, Homeless Management Information System. We have mutually reinforcing activities, and these happen every day through our continuum of care on homelessness process, where we bring all the stakeholders to the table to help us drive change in our community. We try to have continuous 
communication, but I'll tell you how challenging this is with a broad-based collaboration, because this is the number one thing we're criticized for, is people don't know what's happening and we're not communicating everything. And this is continually a challenge. We have one full-time person whose only job it is is to communicate what's happening in our homeless system so people will understand. And fifth, we have a backbone support organization, and that's the role that we play. So just to give you an example of how we have implemented a collective impact approach, I want to talk to you for a moment about the board of directors that we have for our continuum of care on homelessness. And our continuum of care on homelessness is the board that sets the policy and the priorities for Chicago's homeless system. And on that board, we have all of the people who have the resources for homelessness. So we have the chief operating officer of the city of Chicago. And when she was sitting on the board and she understood that we needed 10,000 more units of affordable housing, she went back to the mayor and she advocated for the work that we were doing and for the system that we were building. And the mayor signed on to this and said, I'm gonna provide you with a few thousand additional units over the next couple of years. We have the chief housing officer from the Chicago Housing Authority. And before she became engaged in our work, homelessness was never a priority for the Chicago Housing Authority. The first thing they did was they set aside 450 units. We used up those units very quickly. And the second thing they did was they said, we're going to make homelessness a priority for Chicago Housing Authority housing. We have the chief operating officer of Cook County Hospital because one of the things that we know is there's an incredible relationship between health and housing. And we know the cost to a healthcare system if people are not housed. And so because of our relationship with Cook County Hospital, they provided some initial funding to pilot a program where people would be discharged from, from the hospital who, who were homeless, and instead of discharging them to homelessness, they were discharged to housing. And we saw, we tracked the cost to the healthcare system by moving somebody into housing instead of into homelessness. And the, Chico and the um, Cook County Hospital saved so much money, they now have said, we're gonna provide you with a million dollars to continue this effort in the community. Because it's so important to be inclusive, and to make sure that you have the right people at the table who can help you make the right decisions. We also always include service providers who are doing the work every day on the ground, moving people from homelessness to housing. And of course, we always include the voices of people with lived experience because they provide to us an understanding that we could never have ourselves. And so, thirdly, I mentioned that the other thing that you really need to focus on if you want to turn your community from being one that has had decades of increasing number of people experiencing homelessness to reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness, you have to let data drive your decisions. I'll tell you that from the time our first plan to end homelessness started in 2001, the city of Chicago actually housed the data system that was tracking everybody who was experiencing homelessness in Chicago. And for 10 years, the city fought with service providers about why this system didn't work. In the middle of that 10 years, the city decided to throw out the software system and get a new one because maybe it was the software that just didn't work but that wasn't the answer. And so in 2012, All Chicago took over this software system, HMIS, and we made the decision that we wanted to build a system of high quality data that helped us understand what was really happening in our homeless system so that we could change it and make it better. And so one of the first things we learned as we started to look at the data was this concept of inflow and outflow. We'd never thought about it like that before. 
we thought we have so many people experiencing homelessness and they were counted once a year by our point in time count, we never thought about what the inflow and the outflow looked like. And when we started to look at that, what we found was that every single month more people were coming into our system than we were housing. And so we had to figure out how to change that. So when we started looking more deeply at the concept of inflow, we did some research and we started to look at where are people coming from. And what we learned was that over a third of the people entering our system were being evicted. And so we joined in partnership with the eviction court in Chicago and we trained the judges and we trained the attorneys and we set up a little desk right at eviction court with our emergency fund homeless prevention um, funds. And so what we were able to do was divert the people who were being evicted by providing them with rental assistance or back rent so that they could stay where they were. We also were able to connect them to the other programs and services that they really needed. The other thing we did was we trained all of the service providers about how to access this prevention funding. So we wanted to make sure that if you were working with people on the verge of eviction, believe me, we want them to stay home and not end up in a shelter or on the street. The other thing that we started to look at was the number of days that people were experiencing homelessness. When we started to look at this, it was 288 days it was taking us to house someone. Our goal was 90. Today it takes us 188 days. We're still not where we want to be, but we're working on getting to 90 days. And so, the thing that I want you to remember are that if you really want to change the way your system works, stop thinking about charity and think about problem solving. Look at developing a collective at impact approach and focus on data. And for us, we've gone from decades of increasing the number of people experiencing homelessness to the last four years where we have an over 20% reduction in the number of people who are experiencing homelessness in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I am struck by your remarks, particularly because we know in Toronto that 20,000 different households are evicted annually. So some interesting statistics relative to success in the prevention, the area of prevention. Uh, our next speaker uh, hails from Vancouver. Um, and uh, she is a planner at the city of Vancouver and uh, her bio is with you as well. So I'd like Andrea Gilman to come up um, and walk us through a little bit around what Vancouver is doing, but also uh, they've recently adopted a 10-year plan, so she'll be discussing some of that with you as well. Andrea. Hi, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm excited to share some of the um, learnings I have from Vancouver and some of the inspiring ideas that uh, that we are looking at or exploring in Vancouver. Okay, and thank you to Noni for working out the technical uh, glitches for me. So I thought I would start off just with a little bit of context. We're a little bit different in Vancouver. We are considerably smaller than you are. Uh, we're a city of 630,000 in a region of 2.3 million. So a fraction of the size here. We in Vancouver have about 26% of the regional population. And in terms of land mass, we occupy about 115 square kilometers. And I think in comparison to Vancouver, you guys are about five and a half times bigger than we are by, by land mass, if I'm, um, if I'm thinking correctly. Uh, we're a city of renters. So I think we have the opposite statistics that, that Toronto does. We're 53% of our population rents, and that's a number that's been increasing um, over the last uh, few census periods. What we do know about that, um, 53% it's increasing, but when we look at the number of new households coming into Vancouver um, in the last census period, I think it's just over 70% of net new households that are renters, whereas looking back to the previous uh, census period before that, that figure was about 40%. So if you look at that shift, we are really not leaving people with a lot of options when they're coming to, Van to Vancouver as far as ownership or, 
or rental, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, something you're more familiar with, and I think where we definitely align between Vancouver and Toronto and cities around the world really is we are facing a very acute housing crisis in Vancouver as, as you are here in Toronto. Um, we've had rapid population growth. Uh, we've had an increasing reg regional labor force that's impacting our um, rental stock in Vancouver. On the ownership side, we have the highest housing prices in Canada. Our average housing price is about a million dollars right now. Um, and we have prices that continue to increase kind of on a curve like this and the incomes that just stay like this. And I think it's a similar situation here in Toronto, but a complete disconnect between the housing prices and, and the incomes of the local population. Um, and again, we've got um, an increasing trend towards real estate as a commodity and investment. I think similar to Toronto again. Um, on the rental side, we have the highest rental rates in Canada and we have a consistently low vacancy rate year over year. Um, the last number of years we have fallen below 1% and so a healthy vacancy rate is around 3 or 4%. We've consistently fallen below 1% and when we break out the housing stock, if you look at kind of the lower end of the housing stock, renting around seven fifty up to $1,000, that vacancy rate is about zero. There is no vacancy in, that, in those um, units. When you look at the upper end of the stock, the newly built rental units, renting maybe 2000 and above, that's where you start to see a vacancy rate that comes, creeps up just above 1%, but not, not much. Um, we have a persistent and increasing um, homeless population in Vancouver. Um, and all of these things, what the impact is, among, among other things, is uh, changing the income, income distribution in the city. And I put up these two graphs, one representing um, owner household annual income and the other representing uh, renter household annual income. But you can see the trend is, is the same. If you look at the yellow bar along the top and the blue just below, those are um, households, household annual income above 150000 and incomes between 80,000 and 150,000. You can see over the last 10 years, that's what, what's happening is that the share of those households as a percentage of the overall population is increasing. And on the lower end, if you look at the red bar along the bottom in both owner and renter households and the blue just below it, those are the households earning 15 to 30,000 and um, below 15,000. And so those are getting squeezed. Those are becoming a smaller and smaller proportion over the last 10 years um, of our households. And so, um, where we got to in 2017, I think, is a similar place where you guys are now. We were about halfway through our previous housing strategy. So in 2012, we brought in a housing and homelessness strategy. And um, in, in 2017, 2016, when we started the engagement on our new Housing Vancouver strategy, we really felt that if we didn't start to pivot and change direction, all of those housing prices, uh, kind of bullets that I've just addressed, and the income distribution would really um, put us further and further and further at, at, at risk. So um, on the right hand side of the uh, slide is kind of the major themes from our housing strategy and so uh, they range. We've got over 100, 100 actions in the plan. Um, this kind of main pieces of the plan are really about, or the main themes are about the right supply, which I'll, I'll talk about in the next slide, protecting and um, preserving our existing rental stock because that's really where the affordability exists. A lot of our existing older rental stock is, um, has rents that are akin to social housing rents and also to focus on the, um, the city's most vulnerable populations. Um, I wish I had a magic bullet to share with you today. I've got some ideas, but what we've really learned in pulling together this strategy is that there isn't one magic bullet, but there's really a need for a comprehensive strategy and that, that it's really all of these pieces pulling together and all of the partnerships coming together to try to to affect change. And so this is a, it's a, a 10 year strategy, so 2018 to 2027 that we've brought in. Um, and just touching on the right supply a little bit and what we mean by that, that is really shifting, um, shifting the targets in the plan to align with uh, the housing that is needed by the people that live in Vancouver at the incomes that are affordable to the people that live and work in Vancouver. And so we have a target of 72,000 new housing units over 10 years. That's almost double what we had in our previous plan that came in in 2012. Um, amongst that, the real shift is around um, the focus on rental housing. And so it's about purpose-built rental housing, it's about social housing, it's about supportive housing and co-op housing. And in that rental mix as well is an assumption that we're, while we're still building condos, a portion of those condos will become part of the secondary rental stock where almost immediately upon purchase or investment they are um, flooding into the, the rental market. And then we also had a shift around um, a focus on families. So about 40% of the housing units in this plan are targeted towards families. So two and three bedroom units that can 
can house families, and then also thinking about a range of housing types. So we did a lot of uh, engagement and work with the um, with the community to look at the form of housing that people want, and obviously not everybody wants to be in a in a tower, and that there is a real need for seniors and uh, downsizing seniors and for families for ground-oriented housing. So we've had a real push, and we've seen, um, I think, uh, a lot of development around laneway housing, which are rental and have to be rental rental by their nature, and um, around townhouse form development for families. And so. Um, I guess I'm going to take you through a couple examples now and really focusing on the lower end of the continuum here, the green, so social and supportive housing and purpose-built rental housing. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is addressing homelessness through supportive housing. And so we have introduced, starting in fall of 2017, a temporary modular housing program. And this is an initiative that was started through the provincial government. They had a target of 2,000 units province-wide. We um, in Vancouver were quite keen to look at how we could assist with that, how we could provide sites for those um, projects and bring some of the dollars into, into Vancouver. So um, the temporary modular housing program is really about a rapid response to homelessness and bringing people indoors as quickly as possible. Um, it's for about providing high quality units, so self-contained units with, uh, where individuals have a kitchen, a bathroom, and there is, there's dignity in the unit that they have, obviously. Um, also to provide temporary housing while other housing is being built. We've had a lot of approvals of social and supportive housing over the last number of years, but you know, construction and the approval process takes a long time, so these are uh, a way to move people in uh, off the street quickly. Uh, it also connects people with supports and services um, and makes use of vacant or underutilized land, so both public and private. We have a number of sites that are on city-owned land, but we have also uh, leveraged partnerships with various developers and as a way to uh, utilize some of some of their land that is maybe part of a larger site development where there's a parcel that's coming will be developed later we can use those those lands in the interim and um, in terms of where we've gotten to I mentioned we introduced this in the fall of 2017 in March of 2019 we opened our last building and so we have 13 buildings on 10 sites and we have opened 606 units of temporary modular housing and about, I think it's about 75% of folks are coming in off the street into those buildings and the number, the remainder are um, being transferred from other, from other housing or hospitals uh, as well. All of the units are built off site. So they are fully assembled when they arrive on site on a trailer and, or a truck and they are uh, craned into the foundations laid, they're craned into place and stacked up in just a matter of days. So it's, it's kind of exciting. I'll provide a link at the end that um, you can go to to watch a little time-lapse video of how that happens. Um, these are what the units look like. So they range in size from 250 to 350 square feet. Uh, the building themselves, the buildings themselves, as you can see in that last photo, they're all three stories. They range from about 40 to 50 units. And so the units are self-contained. They will have a shared, uh, a common laundry area, a shared amenity space, a common kitchen and outdoor amenity space as well. Um, and we have about 10% of the units that are wheelchair accessible. So I'll just move into um, social housing. So a policy that's been um, around in Vancouver for a little while, but we've shifted it through our Housing Vancouver strategy is our inclusionary zoning policy. And so what inclusionary zoning is, that is where we provide the developer um, extra density, usually market density, in exchange for them um, providing a percentage of the floor area or of the new floor area as social housing. It's often um, units that are built turnkey, delivered to the city, ready to go, and we then provide an operator. And so we've been doing it for a while through our sustainable large sites policy, and that's any site that's coming in that's, I believe, over two acres would have a requirement for 20% of the units to be uh, social housing. What we did through our Housing Vancouver strategy is increase, change some of the criteria, but increased it um, not noted on the slide here, but 20% social housing and a further 10% requirement for uh, rental units at moderate income rental rates. Um, and then we have also in the last number of years, sort of since uh, 2013, 2014, introduced a number of new community plans and we have put in place in all of those plans, inclusionary zoning policies that range from 20 to 30% uh, of the units delivered as turnkey social housing. Um, I'm gonna show you on the map here, it's been fairly successful. I think just taking an example on the map here, so the green areas are some of our new community plan areas and some of our large site development. So just taking the West End, which is up at the top there um, on the edge of Stanley Park for people who have been to Vancouver. Um, this is one of our densest neighborhoods in the city. And 
We approved that, we brought that plan to council in the fall of 2013. Just last fall, we opened the first of the inclusionary zoning sites in, in that neighborhood. It's a small project, it's 27 units, uh, social housing units on the bottom, it's luxury condos above, which is most of the combination that we're seeing in the West End right now, and we leased that site for 60 years to one of our indigenous housing providers. And so that's the first of, of many. We have a number of approvals. Uh, and a few projects at various stages of construction or moving through the development process. And we have some other neighborhoods where that policy, there's various projects um, earlier in the development process. And then on our sustainable large sites, um, a big piece of this I think is well, you can see there's a lot of approvals and some of those sites have um, some units built, but I think it takes a lot of patience with the inclusionary zoning policies and with the sustainable large site policy. I think on the, um, something like the West End plan, we have increased density and we've allowed for some fairly large buildings to be built, 40 story towers, 60 story towers. And um, when you're building that high, it takes time and we're getting the units on the lower level. So we're, we're waiting until that building is finished. On some of these other sites, they're often large, uh, large development sites and um, we are getting um, some of the units, but it may be phased. So the first one, the number one there, our beauty center was approved a number of years ago, but those are under construction and we're just in the process of selecting uh, a nonprofit operator for those units. So I think with a little bit of patience, we do uh, see the delivery of those units. Um, just moving along on the housing continuum, I'll talk a little bit briefly about incentivizing rental housing. So this has been a big part of the work that we have been doing in Vancouver uh, since about 2012. We've had a number of rental incentive programs and the, how it works is there's kind of a menu, as we call it, of incentives that are available to a, to a developer. Those would include additional density, parking relaxations, unit size relaxations uh, on a studio unit, um, and development cost levy waivers. Uh, we started out with a short-term Incentives for Rental Program, or STIR, and that was a program that allowed for a uh, developer to come forward with a combination of market condos and rental housing and still um, benefit from these incentives. That program was fairly short-lived and we introduced Rental 100, or projects that are 100% rental, so moving away from the mixed residential uses. Um, and then we further introduced the Affordable Housing Choices, which just broadens the, the areas where um, applicants can come in for uh, rental housing and take advantage of these uh, incentives and then it also broadens the types of housing uh, that they can uh, provide. So while the majority of the program projects coming in under that affordable housing choices policy are still rental, we have seen some development of um, life leases, co-housing opportunities and some interest in affordable home, home ownership models. Um, and so those first three are largely supply programs in some cases where projects are seeking the development cost levy waivers, we are able to secure the rent levels for the first year, but they, they are largely supply and they are creating a fair amount of supply. Um, I guess right now we're, we have approved about 8,000 units, just over 8,000 units of housing since these programs um, came in, about half of which are completed now, and that kind of puts us on par with the level of production of rental housing that we saw in the 1970s. And so similar to Toronto, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, we saw a ton of rental um, being produced. And we're now, I think, just surpassing the 1970s level um, through these programs. So the first three are really about supply. The last one is the Moderate Income Rental Housing Pilot Program. We call it MERP for short, it's quite a mouthful. Um, and what this does is it provides the, the same incentives, a few additional uh, a few additional ones, significantly more density in exchange for providing 20% of the floor area as um, moderate income rental units. And so these are units where the rents are restricted, where there is income testing, they're still managed by the private um, developers, but the rents are um, targeting folks between the 30 and 80,000 uh, income bracket. And so a studio unit would be renting at $950 a month, whereas on the market side that could be you know, eight, double at least, if, if not higher in some cases. Um, so this is a new program that was launched around the same time we brought our plan to council and it is now, um, it's allowing for 20 projects to come forward. They have not had any um, approved yet at council. Uh, they're all working towards that goal. But this is a program that our, our new mayor uh, who came in last fall is uh, quite enamored with and has been talking about it lately. So you may, may see it in the news at times, but um, just to say the rental incentive program have uh, they're, they're all under review right now and we'll be bringing a report forward um, to look at the incentives and look at um, the rental programs next spring, but they've been fairly successful in driving 
an increase in rental production because we were just seeing very, very limited uh, units. So I will leave it at that. I've included some links here to uh, our Housing Vancouver strategy. You can get all the info there, our temporary modular housing program, and then just all the rental programs that I've just named. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Okay, uh, great to have a Canadian example and also a city that is very similar to Toronto in terms of the challenges and uh, some of the learnings. Um, I'm pleased to tell you next week at Toronto City Council, uh, City Council is going to be directing staff, myself and others, to uh, initiate a modular housing uh, in Toronto. So uh, we're very excited about that and we're very excited about working with the Toronto um, uh, Alliance to End Homelessness towards achieving modular housing in Toronto because we need more rapid and certain responses on homelessness. Um, Uh, so I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Mark Joseph, who's the founding director of the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities. And we've asked uh, Mark to join us tonight because of the importance in Toronto of having opportunities in every part of the city for people to live regardless of their income. And this was a central tenant of the charter that uh, City Council adopted in 2009. and. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with Mark over a number of years, actually probably one year, um, but uh, I, um, I'm delighted that he's been able to join us tonight and, um, and share with us his experience working in a range of uh, cities without, within uh, the United States um, on uh, mixed income communities. So Mark, welcome. I think I can use this mic so I can uh, stand out, be a little closer to you all. Let's make sure this is moving excellent. So it's fantastic to be back in one of the world's truly great cities, Toronto. I have family here in the city, so I'm actually here a couple times a year at least, so it's wonderful to be back. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bylow, thanks for hosting us. And Sean has already been lauded and praised tonight, but I'm going to take 30 seconds of my time to... Uh, say some more uh, because I've just been really mesmerized by his leadership. It seems that most people in the room know Sean or aware of him, uh, so you probably know what a treasure you have here in the city, but I have uh, the good fortune of working with uh, directors of housing agencies in cities across the U.S. and really have not met someone uh, like Sean. If you know him, you know that he is uh, not only incredibly knowledgeable, um, really brave and willing to strike out there and try new things. Uh, hilariously funny. So even though we deal with very difficult topics and subjects and very challenging, still can keep the joy in the work um, and just has a huge heart. So I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know him, working with him, and hope this is just, just the start. Uh, let me also, before I say much more, say probably the most important two words that I will say tonight. So if you hear nothing else that I say, you gotta hear these two words. Go Raptors. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean it. As a Clevelander and a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, um, we have our own history, cities. Uh, but as you know, uh, I would like nothing more than to see you all take down the Warriors. You're so close. I know it's this. I know Monday night was tough, and I know where you are right now. It's starting to feel like momentum shifting, but have no fear. You all are awesome on away courts. You've proven that. Uh, and then game seven, if it's needed, we'll be here. But I think we're going to wrap it up in game six. So, so go Raptors. All right. Now we'll get to the less important stuff. Uh, I do want to talk about mixed income communities, and uh, my title is very, very serious. Um, we have not figured out, uh, despite years, and really the history of mixed income communities goes back 30, 40 years, we have not figured out how to create inclusive, equitable mixed income communities. And so there truly is an opportunity for Toronto to lead the way, I hope you all will, um, and we're hoping to support that and be helpful however we can. So I'll give a little bit of background context. Um, I'll talk about what mixed income success would be, very often, we talk about mixed income like it's just an approach. We don't really allow ourselves to envision 
what would it mean for it to be successful? So I at least want to share some of our thinking on that and then really focus in on, okay, what would it take to increase the level of success and what might this mean for Toronto? So for us in the U.S., we have some major societal issues that motivate our work every day in mixed income communities. And you all, once we get into discussion, will let me know to what extent these are relevant here in Toronto and in Canada as well. First of all, and we've already heard a bit about this this evening, is just this growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots um, that certainly seems to be accelerating for us in the U.S. We are getting increasingly diverse in the U.S., as you are in Toronto and in Canada as well. Uh, in our case, the more diverse we are, the more divided we seem to be, the more polarized a society we seem to be. So we're, we're really tearing apart at the seams. You all are probably watching us wondering what the heck is going on uh, south of the border, uh, and we're wondering the same thing as well. And then we're in a moment where there's good news. Our cities are turning around. Right? And cities that for years, urban centers that were stalled are finally revitalizing, gentrified. So there's a good news part to that. The bad news is who benefits from that? And who gets to be a part of our cities once they become as vibrant, as walkable as they've ever been, but they're only now certain people get to enjoy that and others are getting displaced. So we think that mixed income communities, if done right, could be part of, not a magic bullet, but part of the solution to that. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room would know, but, but certainly there's been more and more media attention to the power of place and where you live. More and more research showing that where you live is so tied to your life outcomes. And so therefore we've gotta pay even more attention to what kind of platform we're giving people in their housing and their neighborhoods if we want everyone to be able to seek their best selves, their best trajectories. So there is this potential power of mixed income places. And again, I say potential. We're still looking to see it fully activated. And I would submit to you, there's nowhere that would say to you, we've built mixed income communities and we have achieved all these things on this list. They can provide shared access to the vibrancy, to the resources. They can help bridge social divides, put people in space where they can actually come together. They can increase social networks, social capital. So much of getting ahead in society today is not what you know, it's who you know. And if you only have a constrained network among certain folks, well then that's gonna constrain your opportunities. I think certainly in the US, we've lost faith in a way, we've lost hope in the power of diversity. We almost seem to be settling into, well, birds of a feather flock together. Well, that's just the way it is. And certainly for me and for our center, we are far from giving up on the notion that we're better with diversity. We're stronger with diversity, but we have to prove it. And what we're seeing in a lot of cases, I live in a very integrated neighborhood, Shaker Heights in Cleveland, Ohio area. And what we learn is with diversity comes challenge, it's hard. It's not easy. And so people get to that stage and they kind of want to back off. And our point, and what I'd love to talk about tonight a little bit is, when you hit those challenges, those natural challenges, when you've got folks from different backgrounds, different traditions, different expectations living together, how do you push through that to the other side of it so you could begin to experience what I believe is on the other side, which is the real benefits of diversity. And then finally, I think we are getting stuck in our minds certain images about each other. And you can read about it all you want and you've got the media images. The only way I really know to shift mental models, to shift stereotypes, is to experience someone who's different from yourself for yourself. And that's only gonna happen in mixed spaces. Our schools in the US are more segregated today than they were 50 years ago. So it's not happening in our schools, our workplaces maybe to some extent, but our homes, our communities, our neighborhoods have got to be another place where we're learning to interact with people who are different from ourselves. I think I'm probably preaching to the choir on that, on that front. So this is our center at Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio, and so you get a sense of some of the things we do. We're on the research side, but really we love rolling up our sleeves and getting into the how-to stuff, and that's what I wanna talk about more this evening. Uh, we have a book, uh, which kind of was our first study in Chicago, actually. So I was talking to Noni about some of that. 
Um, and this was really what launched my passion for finding a better way. The book unfortunately tells a bit of a mixed story. V lots of success in physical transformation and falling way short in Chicago on social transformation. And so it's a seven year study of three specific mixed income communities. Uh, let me just give you a quick sense of some of the places we're working now. And as Sean mentioned, we're lucky, blessed to be all over the US and we've also done some work in uh, Regent Park a uh, couple of their part of a couple of our studies. So in Washington DC, there's a foresight initiative called the New Communities Initiative. We're focused on community engagement in that initiative. In San Francisco, other side of the country, we're also another foresight initiative. And this I would submit to you, and they're actually about to roll out a new website. So give them two or three weeks and then check them out. Um, I think this right now is our best hope in the US situation for an equitable, inclusive, mixed income community. So keep an eye on, on Hope SF. Uh, we also have just recently formed what we call our Mixed Income Innovation and Action Network, and it's four cities that you can see right there. Uh, we're focused on the issue of economic mobility. We believe that we're not just building mixed income housing, but we're building it to give people a platform where they should be able to change and improve their economic circumstances. So with these four cities, we're gonna be innovating some ideas around how to do that. And then in our own hometown, Cleveland, actually this is a block from our school, the Commodore building is a mixed income building. Uh, what's great about this one is because it's so close and I teach at a social work school, our students are actually in the building working with residents. And so we're able to engage not just at a research level, not just at a technical assistance level, but our students are actually in the building. We're working with the property managers. So it's kind of our deepest dive in a mixed income community. And then we wanted to kind of move outside of the development complex building uh, context. And so we've also got a project we call the Effective Neighboring Plot Project. And it's just on two street blocks in Cleveland. And we wanted to get out on street blocks that were diverse and understand what does it look like when you try to intentionally promote what we call effective neighboring, neighboring across lines of difference, race and class. So we can talk about that if we have time. All right, mixed income success. So a really quick framework on how we think about and have come to define mixed income success. And this is really based on, at this point, hundreds of conversations over, you know, over well over a decade with residents, with uh, property managers, with developers, service providers, really anyone involved in helping to bring a mixed income community to life and asking them what would be success. And the first challenge we realized is that depending on who you talk to in the very same community, they have a different image and vision of what success would be, right? And so you heard earlier from Noni about a collective impact approach. And one of the key things in collective impact is that you've got the same understanding of success so you're rowing in the same direction. And we find that in many mixed income communities, that's not the case. So here's at least one framework for consideration. So the first thing you need to do be successful is in creating mixed income housing. But it's not just about the housing or the building or the housing site, it's also about the broader neighborhood around the site. And so you wanna see the neighborhood revitalizing as well. And you wanna see the site and the neighborhood or the building in the neighborhood integrated. Very often, if there's an existing building that's been low income, it's isolated, it's separate. People walk around it, people walk around the site. And so you haven't really been successful if you create a new site, but people still walk around it and don't feel like it's part of the neighborhood. Or residents of the building hunker down in the building. They don't feel like they're part of the neighborhood around them. You also wanna avoid displacement. This is probably the huge one, and the more and more people hear about mixed income housing, we really have a pushback in the US now because people just see that as a cover for gentrification. So you're doing mixed income housing, that means we're gonna get pushed out. So a major success measure is that you avoid displacement and we wanna be very specific by income or race and ethnicity. And one of our challenges in the US is we don't really wanna talk about race or talk about ethnicity. We shield it in terms of income. We used to talk about mixed income, mixed race communities. You don't hear us say that much anymore. We say mixed income. And so part of our work, we feel, is to lift up the issue of race and racial equity and racism as a part of this challenge. So we can talk about to what extent that's relevant in a Toronto context, what, to what extent that's relevant in Canadian context. Although I heard you guys had solved racism up here north of the border. 
No? Okay, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so you want to avoid displacement. You also want to attract and retain an income mix, right? So these are sometimes areas of our city that were no-go areas. So if you're successful, you attract people, but the key word there is retain. It's more than just building housing, as I mentioned. It's also about building a community. And so to what extent do the individuals who live in that building or that compl complex interact with each other, build those social networks? And then finally, as I mentioned, economic mobility. Are individuals and residents able to use the housing as a platform to change their circumstances? So really quickly, how are we doing? We would say on a couple of these, um, we're being very successful in the field as a whole. We know how to physically redesign and transform the site. And actually, that we're showing that the neighborhoods are also revitalizing. Where we begin to get into trouble is the displacement factor. And then as far as attracting and retaining, we would say that's a mixed story. Absolutely able to sell units, rent units at incredible prices in areas of the city that were no-go zones. But do people stay is another question. Once they have children, as their families grow, and part of the challenge is, if we're trying to create a community, you need folks to stay in that for long enough for those relationships to take hold. So if you're seeing turnover, you're not being as successful as possible. And then the two areas that really concern us are the community building, this notion of inclusive social dynamics. We find that folks are in instead experiencing friction from each other and exclusion from the broader community. And then economic mobility, despite the fact that the residents we've interviewed love their units, love the stability and the safety of their community, when we ask them how they're doing economically, they still report being in very tenuous economic circumstances, still running out of food by the end of the month, still not able to pay rent. So the mixed income housing is not translating as it should into a change in economic trajectory. All right, I'll close out. Well, let me show you one thing in terms of how we're we go. Uh, we've developed, you might not be able to read this very well, but just a sense of how we're trying to apply this. This is our mixed income inclusion guide and what you'll see is we have those six categories uh, down the left side here. We're trying to frame out questions that you could ask planning departments, you could ask developers, you could ask the property managers. Have you really tried to be as intentional as possible about each of these areas of success? I'm going to quickly walk through the, these areas and then we can open up for some Q&A. So in terms of designing mixed income housing, what are some of the keys? Certainly the golden rule will be that the subsidized housing has to be indistinguishable from the market rate housing. I think that's something that we now do quite naturally. But often we design it so that we're not facilitating as much interaction as we can. Are we designing in third spaces? Are we designing doorways that face each other, pathways so that people will meet each other? And then those third spaces and amenities, are we making sure that those are on-site and inclusive, welcoming, so it's a place where people are coming together? In terms of integrating with the site and building the neighborhood, that really requires, and you heard it again from Noni, partnerships. And I think tomorrow, for those of you who come back, we're going to be talking a lot about partnerships. So it takes a lot of coordination to really make sure that the neighborhood level work is connecting to the site level work you want to really think hard about who has access to the site and how do you provide a sense of welcome on both ends. Very often we see in these mixing communities, there's a natural instinct to wonder, so who is that community center for, right? Is it for the low income residents or that business center? Is that for the higher income residents? It's kind of a natural, it's very sad, but it's a natural human instinct to kind of figure out, right? Is that for my tribe or that tribe? And if you're building a mixed income community, the whole point is it's for all of us together. And so you have to kind of go the extra mile because there's this assumption that things on site are for one group or another. As I mentioned before, sites and buildings where people still walk around it instead of through it. They haven't really adopted it as part of the neighborhood. And are there intentional means of bringing folks together and connecting residents to the larger neighborhood? In terms of displacement, this is one you just have to get ahead of. Once a community, and I'm sure you know this very well here in Toronto, once a community begins to gentrify and take off, it's very, very hard to get ahead of it. Very hard to slow it down. So the more proactive you can be to think about all the anti-gentrification measures, land trusts, site control, resident involvement that you can put into place. 
in the broader neighborhood. You might be developing a building, but have you thought about the impact that that building is going to have on the neighborhood around it? And what's the level of communication that's going on with the broader neighborhood? We talk about residential displacement, people getting pushed away, they have to move somewhere else. But there's another very important kind of displacement, and that's what we call cultural displacement. You're actually able to stay in the community. Maybe you have housing that has a subsidy that allows you to stay, but you don't feel like that neighborhood is your neighborhood anymore. Suddenly the stores and the amenities and the policing and I could go, the property management are all treating you as, this, as if this isn't your community. So we've really got to pay attention to cultural displacement as well as physical. Uh, one of the things we've done in DC is we've uh, experimenting with a belonging campaign to be really explicit that everyone belongs. And I think you saw a sign, a photo earlier uh, of Sade saying, I belong in this community. Um, attracting and retaining higher income residents. I'll just kind of focus here on property management. We tend to have property managers who either know affordable housing really, really well, or they know luxury market rate housing really well. Mixed income property management is a whole other animal. And to my knowledge, we don't have any trainings that exist for mixed income property management. I mean, if I could only speak to one actor in a mixed income community, developers, asset managers, service providers, I'd want to talk to the property managers. I think they are the front line. And so in this notion of attracting and retaining higher income residents, the property managers set the tone for how are we going to have shared norms and expectations, and how is everyone going to roll up their sleeves in terms of making sure that the community is inclusive and welcoming. Uh, th to these kind of issues of social cohesion, social dynamics. Again, the key here is to be intentional. We've learned the lesson that it's not going to work itself out. You can't just leave it to itself. And we have lots and lots of ideas now. Um, and I know you have them here in Toronto and across Canada already. I don't know that we apply them as much. There's so much work to do in building the buildings, getting people moved in, getting them leased up and maintaining them, that often the notion of intentionality around the social aspects gets left for someone else to do. And then finally, economic mobility. You've already heard this evening, it's not the job of one particular program or one particular entity. It's a comprehensive strategy. It's got to be ongoing supports. And I think where we're falling short, and I hope that our network will be able to break some new ground, I don't know that we leverage the mixed income context like we should. What we often see in the states is you'll have a mixed income community and then folks will put a jobs program and they'll put a job developer. But are we really using, for example, the social capital that exists, the social networks? Are we making sure that the amenities and the anchor institutions, the hospitals, the universities, know what's going on in that community and are part of creating job pipelines? I don't think we're doing as much as we could do to really use the mixed income environment to shift economic mobility. All right, so I'll close with this slide just saying what are the implications for Toronto. Um, as I see the 10-year list from the last plan and some of the ideas emerging, I'd love to see a more explicit statement that really articulates this is our vision for inclusive mixed income communities and this is our commitment. Uh, we have to recognize there's a lot of capacity, skill building, knowledge building still to be done. And so how is that going to happen for everyone in, this, in the um, process? Role clarity and accountability. Who's responsible for what? In my mind, mixed income inclusion is everyone's role. So do all players realize that? How do we refine our strategies and make sure that we're being clearly intentional? And then make sure that we're focused on assessment and learning. I think very often that we're so focused on getting one part of the process done and then moving to the next that we don't take the time to kind of learn from what did we learn and what could we course correct. So having that assessment and learning in place is also going to be very, very important. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, wow. Uh, a lot of rich content tonight. Um, we're going to uh, open it up uh, in the next uh, half hour uh, to you uh, to ask questions of the panel. If I could ask the other panelists to come up as well, and I'll moderate uh, questions that you may have. I am prepared, because this is Toronto and we're generous, uh, to, um, to um, 
encourage a comment if you have a comment that may not be a question. I just would like it to be about housing tonight, though. So um, I just want to say one other thing about Mark's comment about the Raptors. Um, I gr greatly appreciate, greatly appreciate his support for the Raptors in the interest of fairness. Because tonight, either St. Louis or Boston are going to have a Canadian Cup, the Stanley Cup. <laughs> so it, it's only equitable and fair that we would get the NBA championship. Okay, and uh, if you could say perhaps uh, who you are and if you are affiliated with an organization that might help us understand a little bit more about you, but uh, here we go. Um, and uh, you'll be taking the, the mic around so we have a mic as well. So uh, over here, please. Oh, okay. Thank you all so much. Incredibly rich and interesting presentations. Um, I think I have about 20 questions for each of you, so I'm going to just try to boil it down to one, and uh, I'll have to talk with you tomorrow. Um, so uh, my name's Emily Perazzi. I teach in urban studies at U of T. Uh, and I'm a member of the External Advisory Committee for the Housing Plan in Toronto. Um, and so I think I'd like to ask Andrea kind of a big picture question. Here in Toronto, we find ourselves on the threshold of this new housing plan and on the threshold also of inclusionary zoning. Um, and I think that there's an appetite to be bold and yet there's also fear and concern. And in particular, fear about um, inadvertently halting development or affecting the prosperity of the city. So I'm interested to hear uh, what you can offer us from Vancouver. Did the development industry fold its tent and leave the city once you started requiring 20 or 30 percent affordable units? Uh, has it been a total disaster trying to integrate social housing in strata title uh, into condominium builds? Um, what can you tell us from the other side that can help to assuage some of the fears that we're hearing expressed here in Toronto? Okay, sure. That's uh, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it's been a mix. We certainly haven't, uh, I guess as I mentioned, we've implemented uh, inclusionary zoning policies in all of our recent community plans kind of in a big way. And in some cases it's been through a requ rezoning requirement and in other cases it's been through a uh, district schedule. So just a need to go through our development permit board and not a large rezoning process. So it's considerably faster. Uh, the developers certainly haven't gotten up and, and, and run off. Um, but I think it, it takes time. So the example I gave of the West End, that's a neighborhood where the land values the land is just trading, you know, from uh, year to year when, when properties have changed hands within the timeline of the plan, just millions and millions um, uh, increase in, in price over time. Um, so they certainly haven't run away. I think we did a lot of economic testing uh, in the lead up to all of our community plans, certainly to make sure that this was a viable um, policy to implement and so that's a real key to make sure I have heard of other cities where it's like oh inclusionary zoning is a fantastic idea let's put it in but they haven't necessarily done all the economic testing to make sure that that is is something that is viable now and will be viable in the the life of the plan and we've typically done 30-year plans um, I think so so certainly we're seeing a lot of movement on the inclusionary policies like I say on the larger sites where it's not one site but it's a it's a large site that is maybe a phased approach. It's, it's a little bit about being patient and just waiting for those units to come and you might get the first site and the second site um, years later. But I think um, what we've always done on those larger sites is um, just put in place some, um, I think, protection in a way so that, um, I'm just thinking of a few recent ones that have completed, 
where there was one social housing standalone building and I think four market developments. We put in place measures where if the developer wants the occupancy permit for their market developments, they first need to deliver the social housing building. So what I would encourage measures like that, and in, in that case, the project that I'm thinking of, that building was actually delivered early, which is, is kind of unheard of, but, but things like that. Um, in other cases where it's a larger site, a phased approach, we would put in place a timeline that the site be transferred over to the city by year X and you know allow time, but um, that. Where we've run into trouble is, so on the inclusionary zoning, these are uh, parcels that are coming over to the city and we try to make them as, you know, a contiguous, neat, little, tidy airspace parcel that we can then manage or lease out to, to a nonprofit. And, and typically how we've done that is we've had um, a condo door on one side and a social housing door either, you know, on the other side of the, the hedges or around the corner or what have you, both prominent entrances, but we've run into a lot of um, interest from council, a lot of scrutiny from the public about, about doing that. And we're just doing a bit of research now to look at how we can uh, make those spaces more inclusive, shared spaces, and, and shifting towards um, shared amenity spaces. I always think if we can't have our children play together in those buildings, you know, like where, where are we gonna start if we can't do that? So I think thinking through some of those pieces, but overall, um, I mean, you can see on the slide that I presented earlier, there's been a fair number of approvals over the last number of years on inclusion, and it's been very successful um, to date. I think we've got a question over here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name's Smith Walsh. I'm a parent of a child with a disability. I'm interested in cultural uh, I'm also interested in what's going on in Regent Park. There's a uh, and I'm curious to know from Mark's comments about gentrification in a area that's been less than wonderful and that's been trying to revitalize it. There's been a lot of high-end condo building going on in Regent Park. And uh, I know Daniels is doing a number of things that are good, but I'm just wondering what you can tell us either about the gentrification. It, you know, like there have been articles between 205 and now, 205 is a long time ago, but that a lot of displacement has gone on with uh, racial groups, uh, low income groups, that a lot of the cultural norms that kept the place more or less safe have disappeared and now there's kind of no rules. In one of the articles it said, one of the young people said, we used to have rules about when you shoot, you don't shoot during the daytime. <laughs> sort of thing, I thought, well, stay inside at night then, you know? So if, I don't know if Mark well, can ahead, comment on that, that or ahead, just whether that's going to become gentrification. So I, I'll start and then maybe Sean yeah. will jump in. I mean, certainly would say, as you know, it's been a long, I mean, many, many years. So I think there's been a tremendous amount of lessons learned. Uh, one of the things that we focused on at Regent Park, which we think has been on the leading edge of mixed income communities, is this question of resident voice and governance and decision making and who has a say in what happens in the community. It's been so long that Regent Park is now on its kind of second rollout of a way of getting at that, but we've been tremendously impressed at least with the both commitment and focus on bridging between the condos and the TCHC units. In most developments, we don't see that. We see you know, forums for the tenants of the housing authority to meet and talk, and then there are condo associations, and you don't see shared spaces, and so I think that's been a very important place. Um, and the willingness of TCAC and Daniels and others to make an effort at a particular approach, wind it down when it's not working, roll out another one. I think they're only a couple years into the next structure, but I think it's been very promising. I think there's a lot to learn from that. As far as the gentrification, I don't know, Sean, if you have. I, so, so I could comment as well that um, through the revitalizations, uh, there have been challenges, uh, particularly because what we've done through the revitalizations is we've built buildings to replace the social housing and then we have the condominiums. So in some respects, they're not mixed income communities in the form that Mark has spoken about. The new housing now initiative that we've developed for the 11 sites would have the integration of all those incomes together. And um, I think as well, we've got some further um, revitalizations that will be coming forward through Toronto Community Housing. 
and there's an opportunity to actually advance a, some changes to the model more again in the context of what Mark was speaking about tonight. So one of the reasons we asked him to come uh, to Toronto and to uh, participate in this exercise was so that we could um, do better mixed income housing on a physical level, but also in the way that it works um, going forward um, in the management of these communities and in the design of these communities. Another question in the back. Thank you very much. That's a terrific question. Okay, I'm Michael Rosenberg. Um, just in general, I think we should take into account that the reason housing is such an affordability issue is because the economy is actually declining. So your biggest expense is then becomes unaffordable. And, and we have to look at the fact that um, the, the modern knowledge economy, technological economy is actually reducing productivity. So, and, and once we can actually start to speak of it in those terms, then we can start to address that. Um, but but the, the thing I'd like to actually have is more of a question is um, about the mixed communities. I mean, I notice that people don't actually so much mix with people as they mix with something that's going on, like what we're doing here today, um, which, <laughs> um, so, I mean, my point is, like, what do you think should be going on in a community to get people to mix? And the, the aspect of it that I'm most concerned about is what, what values are represented by it. Like, I tend to notice that in Canada, the kinds of values that are expressed by community activity is often somewhat slanted towards a kind of politics of resentment and, and feeling oppressed and a kind of authoritarian kind of controlled meeting environment. And I don't think either of those things expresses the kinds of values that help people get ahead in society and make good economies. But it's hard to sort of address that problem simply because to ad address values that actually build people's character, when you're not starting with people who have material resources, there, we don't seem to have a good way of thinking about the consequences of our values and how to choose what values we want to transmit. So like what kind of, um, what kind of community activities do you think should be encouraged? An excellent question and a, a really excellent point. I'm not sure if this mic is on. It seems like you can all still hear me though. I can yeah. speak up. Oh. How's this? Yeah. No, it's back off. All right, but I can just speak without it loudly. So you're absolutely right, I think, that people gather around activity, around things they want to do together. Uh, and when you ask what kinds of activities, the best way to determine that is from the people who you are trying to get involved in. So I think often one of our mistakes has been to try and sit outside and think of something that worked in one community and then bring it to the next community. I mean, there's no end of activities you could think of. So I want to tell you about a very specific example of a way of bringing people together and creating a different kind of value space, because I think the other really important point of your question was around this notion of values and what kind of values are we expressing in the ways we interact with each other. So all credit for this answer isn't to me, but to uh, my friends with a group called Trusted Space Partners, and you can Google them later. Uh, they're my gurus of community engagement, community building, and Bill Trainer and Frankie Blackburn are the principals in this group. We formed a partnership with them because they're so wise around how to do this activity work around values. So they have this um, strategy, they call it one of their devices or practices called Neighbor Up Nights. And it's intentionally designed to replace the community meeting. And in your question, you kind of reference the way we tend to get together in meetings. And if you've been to community meetings in these environments, they're often not the most enjoyable places to be, right? Folks come in, it either is a gripe session, and folks are really griping about what's wrong, because this is their one opportunity to communicate it, 
or they're being talked to or lectured to by a property manager who's telling them things they should not be doing, right? So not a fun environment. A neighbor up night is a very festive, open environment. You walk in the door, there's color, there's decorations. Bill and Frankie refer to it as a party with a purpose. There's music playing. All the chairs are arranged in a circle. So they would walk into this room and they would say, oh, you've got the room set up wrong. So you would have, everyone's in a circle. And the first thing you try to do is set an aspirational environment. And so the first activity, they call it a new and good. You go around the room, literally everyone in the circle says very quickly something new or good that's happened to them in their life in the last week. And it just sets a very different tone. And you can do it in literally 10 minutes. But you set a different kind of value for yourselves. We're also here to talk about what's good. Here's the key part for your question about activities. The second part of the evening is called table talk. And what happens at table talk is the people in the room that night get to raise their hand and say, I would like to host a conversation about how we have a chess club in the community how we start a community garden, how, what we're gonna do about cars speeding on such X and Y and Z corner. And so the discussion that night is what the people in the room wanna talk about, and they host the conversation themselves, and then they can decide. Either the conversation came and went, it was fine, we move on, or we actually wanna start the, the chess club. You'd like me to try this again? Yeah. Or we'd like to start the chess club. So exactly to your question, if we can create mechanisms through which the community members themselves, and by the way, it's not just residents who sit in the circle, but the staff, the pastor, the school principal, everyone's in the circle. We break down the boundary between those who work here and those who live here. We should all be part of the community, and we get to talk together about ideas and then put them into play. So it's, a, it's an excellent question. You got a question here? Oh, there, and then we'll come here. Hi, my name is Jess Cahoon. Um, I'm a resident in social housing, in a senior's building, and my question is about living in, in, in place. Um, the, with the growing economic disparity and the fact that senior citizens are living on very fixed incomes, if I wasn't working, over half of my income would go towards housing, and that's in social housing. So I heard the figure $950 a month being a reasonable rent in Vancouver, and I know I'm pretty well off because I'm a senior, so I do have income. But for the people who are homeless or are underhoused, people who are on ODSP or social works, that would be unattainable. How do we include um, both living in space for seniors, because more and more people are getting there, and also in encouraging and engaging people uh, without those economic means to actually live? Because the, the concept of affordable housing in, is being debated right now, and 80% of market rent in Toronto is $1,800 a month. And nobody who is living on social assistance can afford that. I can, I can start. I think that's a great, uh, great question that you have. So the 950, just to clarify, the 950 is a... Um, in a rental building, so it's not intended to be a social housing project, but it is, um, I think it comes down to the partnerships and the um, partnerships with the nonprofits, partnerships with senior levels of government in order to make those units affordable kind of in the long run and where we don't have those government um, subsidies coming into the program so that we can't have folks on income assistance or um, at the lower end of the housing spectrum being able to live there, it's about the cross-subsidy within the building, and um, I think in Vancouver we recognize that when we say social housing, a third of those units are significantly more affordable. A minimum of a third of the units tend to be significantly more affordable, and the remainder of the units may go all the way up to uh, definitely higher income earners, so singles up to 70, earning up to 70,000 a year, families earning just over 100,000 a year, recognizing that in Vancouver those folks still need some uh, assistance or some reduction on on their rent or rent geared to income unit and using those higher incomes to, to cross subsidize and offset the, uh, the lower, lower income units. But really, it, you know, we need all levels of government on board to, to make it happen. And I think you raise a really good question because it's about the diversity of housing stock and what's available. And for us, we're in the business of bringing people home, right? This is about being home. And home needs to be a place where you feel comfortable, where you're not threatened, and where you feel secure. 
And so the way that we approach this is that we want to find the housing solution that's right for that person. And so some people, a housing solution might mean that they can afford $950 a month for rent. But for many of the people that we work with, that's not possible. And so what we want to do is find the housing solution that's right for, for each person. And then we want to make sure that we're wrapping people with the services and support they need to be able to stay in that housing, be comfortable there, feel safe, feel secure, and feel like they have a stable home. Another question over here, and we have about 15 more minutes for questions. Okay, I'll try and be brief, which people who know me is not my strong suit, but I will try. Um, thank you all three speakers. Sorry, I'm Kira Heinick. I am uh, the executive lead here of the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness. I want to thank you all three for your presentations. Uh, very, very interesting and I think will be useful to our work. I'm also on the advisory committee of Housing TO. And before I go any further, I also want to give Sean a shout out uh, from all of us in the community. Add our voices to what has already been shared today about your leadership and impact in the progress we are making. Um, so Noni, my question is for you. Um, very encouraging to hear from our perspective as the Alliance what is possible uh, down the road with a more sort of data-driven systems change approach. Um, and very, we are very much trying to also make the case that we need to move from a charity model to a problem-solving model. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the impact that has had uh, and then also the role of the community in driving that shift to complex problem solving. I imagine that there's both resistance, so many agencies, uh, as we all know, are driven often by charitable mandates, perhaps traditionally so, uh, but then also what, they, what role community has related in turn to data, understanding things better, seeing results uh, in driving the the shift to complex change. So both resistance and uh, support the community can bring to that, I suppose. That's a really big question. <laughs> um, so, so when we think about resistance, what, what we're actually doing is asking, is asking the community to change. And so for us to be able to move in the direction that we've had to move, it means that some community partners who have been doing the same work in the same way for many, many years are, are starting to understand that they can't do the work in that way anymore. Um, and so they have to think differently about what their future is going to be and maybe think differently about the types of services they're going to be providing to the community. And so that's really hard. I like to think of it as, I, believe me, I want to change myself in a lot of ways, <laughs> and I can't even do that. So how, it, how can we start to move... Um, organizations to think differently about what their future should look like. And for some organizations, it's easier than others. Um, but I think one of the things that needs to be in place for that to happen is a really strong partnership, and it needs to be a public-private partnership. So if you don't have the political will in your community to move in this direction, it's not going to happen. And that means that you have to have an incredible partnership with the city and with all of the funding sources. And you all have to be aligned in terms of what your priorities are so that the, the way that you're moving your community aligns with the goals that you've set and the priorities that you have and the direction you want to move in. Because sometimes, um, sometimes people understand systems change and systems thinking and they are on board and they will all move in that direction. But often you have others who just don't understand it or can't grasp it or can't see what this new future looks like. And so you have to have the support of all of the power brokers in your community to really move in the direction that you need to. Um, so that's, what was the other part of the question? Because I can, I can only keep one part at a, at a time. Well, I think you actually touched on it, but okay. I was thinking in your presentation that bringing on a um, more robust data system that allows oh, yeah. us to understand yeah. and yeah. see the impact of our, ch as we change the yeah. systems approach might yeah. in turn help spur it on and have 
community and city and other funders yeah. continue to want to go in that direction. Yeah. So we were really lucky in Chicago because we had a data system that didn't work for 10 years. <laughs> and so um, we had no place to go but up. Um, but it still took a long time to get people to really trust what the data was saying. And um, it's, a, it, it, it's you, you, have to, you have to allow people to sort of get their hands dirty with the data so that they can really dive into it and see what it is, what messages we're getting about what we need to do to do things differently. And so we really tried to, um, to make the data system as accessible as possible, which is why it's up on our website and why people can go in there and um, play with it themselves to see what they're seeing. But we also took it down to the provider level, and we have about 1,000 um, users of HMIS who are inputting data every day in Chicago. And so we wanted this to work for providers as well so that they could see what was happening in their own programs, and they could then use this data to be able to drive change within their own programs. And so it's really about making it as accessible and open as possible and then um, supporting people to really understand what the data is telling us and the direction that it is suggesting that we need to move. We're going to take about another three or four questions. And um. um hello there. Thank you. Uh, I listen uh, all of you. Yeah. Testing. OK. Hello, and I like the idea that when you're saying about the thoughts, when you give the people and then they become dependent. And it's good, like, uh, we don't want to build up the society, is keep depending on, just give this something, and then the people are keep depending on the government or the program. And, but really it's not working out. We are seeing here in North America, the people, those are living here, work 30 years, 40 years, or generation after generation, they are not able to afford homes. The outer society, they are coming, bringing the money, it's good for our economy, our uh, GDP and the per capita income is increasing, but we are still not able to afford it. And the people come from outside and they are buying one billion dollar like a condo, like one bedroom. And the person with a couple, they are not able to buy and they are working. So we need some sort of uh, the social more skills and the job skills or more job uh, creation that we can make our own money. Our country is getting backwards. You know, our people are getting backwards. And when we are seeing the other countries, they are going more forward. They are just taking the privilege, you know, what we get. And now, like, after 30 years, I'm seeing on my street, my city, Toronto, the people are begging. Why we are bringing them just to beg in the country, right? We have to create some jobs for them, a society that can fulfill, not just for begging, right? So how how the governments are working for, they are even providing them the house, but they don't have a job. What their job is, just to beg? I don't understand the idea for bringing people and only the either the rich people, they are not working here, they just buy the homes, they have a lot of money, and the other people way too poor. And the people who lives here, they work hard whole their life they're not able to afford homes. So where we are going, where they have to spend the time. Thank you, thank you. Panelists? I was gonna say, I think that's why we're here. <laughs> because um, you've just identified the big, hairy, complex problem that we have. And we're here to try and figure out how to solve it. And it's, it's not easy, it's hard work. But just the fact that we're coming together in this space to talk about how difficult it is, is the first step. 
I guess I'll pick up as well. You, you talked about this point about dependency and services, and Noni, you let off really nicely with this notion of we've got to move past the charity model. But I think very often, even in the most well-intentioned way, we still think of services and clients and without realizing, yes, there are, there's a stage of supporting someone where you need to offer services, but you've also got to continue over time to get to a place where you're empowering that person to operate on their own agency, their own sense of agency, They're not, their sense of not needing that, but kind of the problem solving that you talked about. It's really hard, and it, that line is different for each person, and I don't think we have enough discussions about that line I don't know that we support our service providers and our organizations to think about that line and to really push themselves to, on the one hand, absolutely want to make sure the services and supports are there for those who are in those circumstances that need it, but that over time, we're moving everyone to some state of uh, self-sufficiency and sustainability. So I think it's an important conversation that I don't know that we have enough. Okay, we've got a couple more, que a couple more questions. and. Uh then we're going to wrap up the evening. I, 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 we're, you can catch this tomorrow, too, because we're doing a whole day at Regent Park, and we do want our panelists to get some rest tonight. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's go. keep going. This is terrific. OK. Um, I live in St. Jamestown, which is a little bit different from Regent Park. You have a mixture of um, community and privately owned housing, but it is almost entirely rental. Um, and we do see a lot of gentrification happening sort of around the fringes and some attempts to gentrify um, by one of the landlords in the area. And having lived there, um, I've realized that we have some bad faith actors. So I'm wondering if any of you, of the three of you, have experience with ways to work in a community where there might be community will um, to have mixed income, to have a diverse neighborhood, to have affordable housing, but you sort of already have things locked down by people who just aren't interested in that goal. I guess I can, I'll jump in. I, and I don't know, Noni mentioned the collective impact approach, which has been around now maybe eight or so years, the first article came out. But if you're not familiar with that, she gave you the kind of five elements of it but it's something you can Google. There's now plenty of literature about that approach. But I think that's part of the key to your point, right? There's often going to be some what you call bad faith actors. Uh, it's very hard for one element of the system to take on that particular actor. Let's just say it's the residents trying to do it, or it's just the city trying to do it. I think that's where this notion of a collective impact approach, where you have a group of players from various sectors including residents, community members, including the city, including nonprofits, including informal organizations, all committing to a certain statement about the vision for where we're going. It makes it much harder for one particular bad faith actor to kind of hold that course when you have a range of other partners who are stating that's not the direction we're going in, and at each and every turn, we're gonna pull back to kind of pull in this other direction. I think very often where bad faith actors are able to hold sway is where there's been no statement. It's kind of the wild, wild west. Come in and do what you will, right? And many of our cities, many of our neighborhoods have been so desperate for any kind of development that they often get excited when someone is willing to invest. And we miss that moment where things have now switched and we should have more leverage to be able to set the rules of the game, the rules of the road for those particular actors. And I don't know that we're seizing the day enough. So again, this kind of more collective approach, which we m often m miss the moment to kind of take advantage of bringing folks together. That's why these conversations tomorrow is going to be so important to bring partners from different sectors to, ha to set those common visions. Uh, often we just have each of us doing our roles very much in silos and hope that it's going to add up to the kind of solution we're hoping to look for. And very often that doesn't happen. Okay, we're going to have two or three more rapid questions and rapid answers. Uh, I've not forgotten about up front here, you, me, you, us. 
Okay, um, I'm Jeff, Jeff Cattell um, with um, Active in Neighborhood Associations. My, my question is directed at Andrea. Um, Andrea? Yes. Um, really, we've, affordability is, is, is at the you know, basis of everything. Um, housing being looked at as an investment, as a commodity, subject to speculation. We've, we've all, all um, experienced the, you know, the, the rapid inflation over the last 30 years um, in, in house prices. Um, but coming from Vancouver, uh, my reading of the global, the star, is, is that a very different path has been followed in Vancouver, in British Columbia, relative to Toronto and um, Ontario. Um, it seems to me that, um, that prices in Vancouver have in fact stabilized over the last couple of years. Government has been activist. Um, and so can, can you give us some context? You're from the city, but... You, being a creature of the province, the same as we are, but there's been things that the province has been doing to put a cap on house prices, things like vacancies, taxes, and, and, and money laundering controls and so on. Can you comment, give us that, that kind of context? Yeah, sure. That's, um, switch mics to this one because I don't have a, as loud a voice. But um, I think, um, yeah, our housing prices have just gone and been on this trajectory for what seems like a very long time now, and I think they've you know, um, doubled in the last number of years. And they're still sort of on that trajectory. I think s they're starting to maybe stabilize, but they're still, you know, they're up here and they're stabilizing. So that's not, not great either. But I'll just highlight very quickly two um, particular actions. So at the city level, um, when we introduced our housing Vancouver strategy and in the months that followed, uh, about six months later, we brought in an empty homes tax. And so um, that's a tax... Um, I think it is at 1% of the assessed value or half percent of the assessed value for homes that are not used as uh, principal residents. And so uh, homeowners are asked to fill out a declaration annually uh, to declare what, um, if they are living in that home as their principal residence. There's a few out clauses, you know, if your home is under construction or if you're away uh, a certain months of the year or you're in the hospital or whatever, there's, there are some out clauses. But... Um, Within the first year, so there was $38 million that was collected through that tax, which um, will now be funneled back into affordable housing. So that's, that's one way, and really the intent is to ensure that properties in Vancouver are for folks that are, are living in Vancouver. So that was at the municipal level, and then at the provincial level, they introduced just in the last year a speculation tax. And so when that came in in 2018, I think that was assessed at half percent, or sorry, at half a percent of the assessed value, and then that increased in 2019 to, um, I want to say one or maybe two percent, I'll have to check my notes, but um, for Canadian, I think for local residents and um, Canadian residents, that tax stayed at, I believe it stayed at a half percent, but for um, uh, foreign investors, the tax was at a higher rate, or satellite families, that was at a, a higher rate. I don't know the statistics on um, the numbers on how successful that has been, but I have heard that is, uh, those are both ways that have um, proven to help to stabilize uh, our housing prices and, again, push some of those units back into uh, the market. Thank you. Uh, so do we have here for... Uh, yeah, I'll, okay, and then the last yeah. question goes to our friend in the front row. Hi, I'm, I'm Jane from Baba Yaga Place, Toronto. I'm a member there. It's a group of women working to create housing for older women. Um, just a quick question about universal design, if you could give comments about what you think or how it could be incorporated into working with developers, having them understand it better so that seniors don't have to move out of uh, their sense of their, their place where they've been living all their lives, and um, why does it seem to be such a problem? <laughs> for them to incorporate it. Yeah, I can touch on that just briefly, but um, for social housing in particular, we have a set amount of units that have to be accessible, but at a citywide level uh, within our building code, and I don't know the numbers, but we have uh, a certain standard. I think it's actually 100% of units have to be adaptable. So they would have the boards in behind the wall. So if you needed to put a grab bar into the bathroom, that's already in place for you. And all you would have to do is put in, in the board. Uh, similarly, all the, le the door handles are, are levers and um, another of other a number of other features that would make a home uh, more livable in the long run so that individuals wouldn't have to, to, to leave. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's a percentage that would be fully accessible, so where the kitchen, the bathroom, the doorways, uh, the balconies, everything is fully accessible. 
Okay, we're going to go to the last questionnaire. Yay, Our yeah, panelists are going to stay around a little bit, so you can uh, chat with them uh, after we broke. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I do believe that inclusionary zoning, mixed income, mixed race, it supports uh, strategies are all welcome in this strategy. Uh, I also would suggest that we include an anti-racist and anti-oppressive uh, oppress framework to the action plan. But I wanted to bring into the conversation uh, another source of homelessness. We've, the conversation this evening was focused more or less on the economic factors uh, that lead to homelessness. I want to introduce or add to the conversation violence against women, which is a huge factor for pushing women and children into homelessness. And I know that you will be uh, present tomorrow, perhaps maybe if, you ca if, if I can leave you with that and you can address it tomorrow on any strategies you may have that may um, support um, housing for, for women and children fleeing violence within, of course, you know, the mixed income racial <laughs> Um, type of housing and within the in, in, inclusionary zoning. Um, I think that's it. Oh, and also, in the absence of rent control mechanisms, how do we see this issue of affordability? Because the whole definition of affordable has changed. What we say is affordable uh, is not affordable. I saw a sign the other day that said affordable housing in the low millions. <laughs> and that's, that's insulting, right? So if we can really talk about context and affordability in its truest sense tomorrow, I, I'm willing to have the answers tomorrow because I know you have to rest and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Um, just about, um, you're absolutely right about um, violence against women and families and, and how that contributes to um, people entering the homeless system. And for us in Chicago, um, that's a really important um, issue and a very big challenge. And so um, we do make sure that we have um, domestic violence shelters and, and housing for domestic violence victims um, available. Not, um, not all of the domestic violence um, housing and services are in our homeless system, but we've recently increased um, the housing and services that we do have available. Um, one of the things that we do in Chicago is transitional housing is something that we're really moving away from, other than for people fleeing violence and for youth, where we find that it does um, work well. But Traditionally, we've moved away from tr transitional housing for everything else. Sorry, so. by the way, my name is Carla Mantel, and I'm with the Nagata Faculty Council. So I forgot to say <laughs> Okay, but we can talk more about it tomorrow. Oh. Oh. Maybe I'll just add very quickly. Um, Final remark. Hello, Mark. Just, uh, you raise a very excellent point about ways into homelessness. I think on the social housing side, what we've seen uh, in some of our supportive housing buildings and social housing is uh, certain operators that are um, that have women-led housing, essentially. So even if it is a couple, it is the, the woman whose name is on the lease. And so if there are issues and the family has to leave, it is the partner who, who would leave and the women and the children can stay in those family units. So that's, I mean, in the social housing, but folks who may have, women who may have come up through that, that route can have that uh, added security in their uh, new housing. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I want a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> to, to remind you as well to continue to engage in uh, the Toronto Housing Plan consultations. Uh, go to the website that's on uh, the uh, handout. The questionnaire to, uh, as part of the consultation is online, so please let your friends, your social networks know about it so that they can uh, contribute. Um, in the interest or in the, it, this is about knowledge exchange and Mercedes got a book over there that was released this week uh, called House Divided. House Divided. And thank you, Mercedes. This is sort of like a game show, right? <laughs> um, 
but it, the, the book was published, um, and it's called How the Missing Middle Can Help Solve Toronto's Affordability Crisis. So we have copies of this book for our uh, panelists tonight because we think there's some things we're doing in Toronto that actually are working, and I think some of you know those, uh, but they're uh, documented, and some of the challenges we're facing are also in this book. So uh, given uh, the quality of the presentations tonight and the deep knowledge that's been shared, uh, we want to present this and provide this to our panelists as well as a gift so that they leave um, knowing that we're going to continue the struggle. We'll see many of you tomorrow, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you.